There is a pathway that produces a sign and a wonder. There is a pathway that produces a champion in the spirit. Are we together? If you obtain grace by God to follow that path, I assure you by the integrity of scripture, your life will become a sign and a wonder. First to you and then to the nations of the earth. It is true. We have captured these thoughts in songs. We have captured these thoughts in sermons. They are representations of our persuasions. And I'm hoping that someday, sooner or later, the body of Christ will understand that there is a path that leads to life. There is a path that leads to glory. There is a path that transforms any believer from any starting point until your life becomes a praise and a glory to the nations i have taught you here in this house and let me remind you for tonight that god's goal for your life is not just to take you to heaven please listen god's goal for your life is not just to get you saved from hell and sin and satan god's goal from your life is that he transits you from being a believer to being a witness a transition from being a believer to being a witness your journey has not stopped if you are still a believer in addition to being a believer there is a transition until you become a witness the assignment is not just for believers the assignment kingdom come is for witnesses hallelujah god's goal is that eventually your life becomes a manifestation of the glory of God. That your life becomes an expression, a testament that men can read God through your life. Your life becomes verses of scripture. That when people look at your life, your life compels an instant Bible study. They study God and they study his ways as they look at your life. This is what God's goal is for you and I and it's important we have this at the back of our minds so that as you come to church week in week out now that you are this miracle service you must have it at the back of your mind that I'm not just fulfilling a religious ritual no this is part of the process that leads me eventually to become a manifestation of the glory of God you believe that say amen, amen. now let me share a few thoughts with us and then we get straight to a time of prayer and ministrations. There are five, this is Easter, by the way, happy Easter. And more importantly, happy uh, resurrection Sunday. Um, again, Easter has created a lot of debates whether Easter is of God or it's not of God. Anything that does not have revelation would destroy you, anything not just easter whether easter christmas your birthday your living your existence anything that does not have revelation the strengthener of any spiritual activity is the understanding that supports it are we together if for you easter is just a ritual the truth is that when you study historically you may find reasons why you should frown at it justifiably so from a historic standpoint but you can nullify the negative effects of history by replacing your, your understanding 
with something word compliant and spiritual. So for believers in Christ, when you celebrate moments and seasons like this, there are five things at least. Let me just point that quickly. The gospel has five foundational pillars. You must understand this. There are five major pillars if you do not believe. The gospel will not profit you. Number one, the humanity of Christ. Write it down. Just a one minute crash course on the gospel. Number one, the humanity of Christ. You must believe that Jesus walked in the flesh. It's one of the foundational tenets of the gospel and even the Christian faith. The humanity of Christ. It matters that you believe that God was made incarnate. The word became flesh, the Bible says, and dwelt among us. Not dwelt in isolation. Men felt Jesus. Men felt Jesus. They ate with him. They walked with him. So the first foundational pillar of the gospel is the humanity of Christ. His earth work. Number two, his death. The death of Christ is the second foundational pillar for receiving, understanding, and maximizing the gospel. His death. It's important for you to know that he died. He actually died. If Jesus killed himself, you would have said he's lying. But he was killed by his enemies. And his enemies testified that they killed him. Are we together now? There are records by the enemies of the cross. They testified that they killed him. Number three, the third pillar that is an anchor to the Christian faith and even the gospel is his burial. It's not just important to know that Jesus died. You must know that he was actually buried. If Jesus were not buried, then you cannot believe in the resurrection. The resurrection is predicated upon the fact that he was buried. Are we together? Before Jesus came, Jesus was not the first person to be brought back to life, but he was the first person to experience resurrection. Are we together now? To be brought back to life means that you depend on the contribution of another. But resurrection as we know it did not happen by the assistance of any man. There were people in the Old Testament that brought others back to life by calling them prophetically. Even Jesus brought three people back to life as recorded in scripture. The son of the widow at Nain. Are we together now? And then uh, the, the Jairus' daughter who had died age 12. And then finally Lazarus in John 11. But nobody prayed or no human being brokered Jesus' returning to life. This is why it's called a resurrection. Are we together now? Yes. His resurrection is unique because no human agent participated in his return. So you must believe the burial. Number one, the humanity of Jesus, his earth work. Number two, his death. Number three, his burial. Number four, his resurrection. The anchor of the gospel and the Christian faith is based on the resurrection of Jesus. This is not my teaching tonight, but I just thought to honor the resurrection Sunday by just planting this in our minds. The resurrection. You have to believe the resurrection. In fact, theologically speaking, the striking difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees was on the matter of resurrection. You must believe that Jesus resurrected. But if you stop there, you have not done justice to the entire discourse of the gospel. Because the last angle to it is his ascension, his ascension and exaltation. You cannot stop at the resurrection. By the time Mary met him at the garden, he was already resurrected, but he was not yet glorified. And he said, she said, Rabboni, he said, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended. I have resurrected, but I've not yet ascended. You go and announce my resurrection. And the Bible tells us, Paul, speaking to the church in Hebrews, tells us that he resurrected, he ascended, and there was a high priestly duty he had to perform as the high priest and the lamb himself offering his blood upon the heavenly tabernacle to make atonement once and for all for us then a coronation service was held to him for him in heaven as seen by david the lord said to my lord and then as paul taught the church in philippi philippians chapter 2 his exaltation he sat at the right hand of the father this is his official place of authority today the hand of power 
And the Bible tells us that he makes intercession for the saints. So you want to believe the gospel, these five pillars, they represent the five foundations of the gospel. Hallelujah. And if you want to add a sixth uh, pillar, for instance, you have to also add his imminent return. He's not just there forever. The Bible tells us that one day that he is going to return. You have to believe that Jesus Christ will return. In Acts chapter 1, after he levitated to the heavens, they looked up and they saw how a cloud received him. And the Bible says they saw two angels and saying, why are you looking like this? This same Jesus whom you saw, he is going to return in the same way you have seen him go. These are the things you need to believe. If you don't believe this, you are not a Christian. Hallelujah. I'm tempted to talk to you for five minutes again about the implication of the resurrection. Can I say that? Can I teach you that? Okay, so um, I've done teachings on it, but I think I should just give you quickly. I will not explain. I will just read it out. There are six at least implications of the resurrection. But I want you to have that down and then we'll just pass this and get straight to the business of the night. Number one, the first implication of the resurrection of Jesus is that the resurrection was a validation that Jesus was truly the Son of God. The resurrection was a validation that Jesus was truly the Son of God. Romans chapter 1, 2 to 4. The Bible tells us that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power, hallelujah, which had promised before by the prophets in the Holy Scripture, uh -huh, concerning Jesus, his Son, which was made the seed of David according to the flesh. Read verse 4, one to go, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So Jesus' resurrection from the dead validated that indeed he was the Son of God. Number two. By the way, it may interest you to know that with all due respect, but every other faith practice have the graves of their founders with the remains of the founder still there. It is only the Christian faith that has an empty tomb. Yes, sir. An empty tomb is proof that he resurrected. History has been able to, in an unbiased way, identify the tombs of many religious founders and there are remains archaeologically preserved. But when you get to that grave, you meet an empty tomb, eternally empty. Same power that conquered the grave lives in me lives in me your love that rescued the earth lives in me lives in me same power that conquered the grave lives in me lives in me your love your love that rescue the earth lives in me lives in me one more time sing it with faith in your heart same power that conquered the grave lives in me lives in me your love that rescue the earth lives in me The reason why you will come out of every challenge tonight is because Jesus came out of the grave. Let me tell you this. If he came out of the grave, it became the basis of coming out of anything that looks like the grave. Are we together now? Yes. Because he came out of the grave, you can come out of anything, any problem, any challenge. I don't care what it is. Number three. Number two. The resurrection gave credibility to all other words that Jesus spoke. I'm doing a recap. We're doing a one-minute crash course on the implication of the resurrection. I've taught it somewhere, not in Koinonia, but we have a teaching where I will reiterate this. And when you hear me teach that on that day, 
Don't assume you wrote it now. I've not explained it at all. You are just believing. I will take time to teach you. Hallelujah. Koinonia is not the place where we do conferences. This is where you are mentored methodically. So I'm not afraid of taking it one by one to teach you until you have that understanding. But just for your knowledge, Jesus said in many instances in scripture that he was going to die and come back to life. The resurrection gave credibility to every other word. If Jesus did not resurrect, then it means we have a right to doubt every other thing he said. The reason why we can believe any other thing he said was that the most implicating statement he made, he defended it. Did you hear what I said? The most implicating statement any man can make is to dare boast that you will die and bring yourself back to life. He said it and he kept it. That means any other thing of lesser value, he said it, he's worth believing. The resurrection gave credibility to every other word. Hallelujah. Three, the resurrection has now become the central theme of the gospel of salvation. This is the third implication of the resurrection. Every time we talk about the gospel of salvation, the central theme is not his earth work. The central theme is not his death, not his burial. The central theme of the gospel of salvation is the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Number five. The resurrection, powerful now. The fifth implication. The re Number what? Ah, okay. The resurrection established the victory of Christ over sin, Satan, death, and the grave. I like this one. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, it was a final stamp establishing his victory over sin, his victory over Satan, his victory over death, and his victory over the grave. Hallelujah. Are we together? So his victory over sin, Satan, death, and the grave. Number five, the resurrection. Today allows anyone who believes in Jesus to be a partaker of his life and victory. The resurrection today allows anyone who believes in Jesus to be a partaker of his life and a partaker of his victory. This is powerful. Ordinary me, ordinary you, for simply believing in Jesus and believing the gospel, we are made partakers of his life and partakers of his victory. This is the reason why we can walk in that victory for ourselves and we can become extensions of that life and victory to as many, even at a miracle service like this. We are partakers of his life and partakers of his victory on account of the resurrection. Can I give you a final thought? Number six. This is powerful. The resurrection today gives every believer in Christ hope beyond death and hope beyond the grave. The resurrection today gives every believer in Christ hope beyond death and hope beyond the grave. I can spend all day teaching this. The resurrection today gives every believer in Christ hope beyond death and hope beyond the grave that means if you've lost any loved one at all no matter how long and no matter how sad the event was if that believer died in christ then you are encouraged the resurrection tells you one day you will see them again hallelujah he arose the prince of peace arose you know that song? Yeah, he arose. Oh, oh yes. yes. Oh yes. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Oh yes. Oh yes. Hallelujah. He arose. Oh yes. Oh yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He arose. The Prince of Peace arose. Hallelujah. He arose. Oh yes. Oh yes. One day you will see your father. 
One day you will see your mother. Oh yes, you will. You imagine anybody who has died in Christ as a visitor who had a long journey. And for you as a believer, when you contend for long life, it's not out of here. It is to give you the allowance to live serving the purposes of the kingdom. But you have an orientation that to live is Christ. But that if you die, is gain. So when you cry over people who die in Christ, it's simply because of the temporary emotional disconnect. But we do not cry as people who are hopeless. No. One day there will be a glorious sound. The sound of an archangel. May it be during a koinonia service. That while we are shouting here, I will drop this mic for you if you are interested in carrying it. Goodness, my God. Mm. Yes, sir. If you are interested in carrying it, you can carry it and say all you want. You will think I'm joking, but it will happen one day. And if you are in this place and you know you are not going, you better listen and when it's time for an altar call, take your destiny serious because the Bible says it will happen. Anybody can argue about that, but it will happen. I assure you by God, it will happen. Hallelujah. Wonderful service. For some, we all go to bed in the night and suddenly that, that trump by the archangel and the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain, the Bible says, we will be caught up together. We will meet with him in the air. And that will be the end of it. We will wrap our dispensation as we know, fold it like a curtain and allow the other activities that are to happen on the earth while we witness from a plane and a dimension that is beyond this realm. When all is done, then the old heaven and the old earth is folded away. And the Jerusalem, the tabernacle from heaven, God descending to be in the midst of his people. He being the light of that city himself. The sun will no more give you sunlight by day. The moon will no more give you moonlight by night. Jehovah will be your everlasting light. He'll be your glory, your strength and your sight. Shine seven times as bright when Yahweh binds up the wounds of this world, he heals all the bruises inflicted by this world. A Christian is one who believes all this truly, and the Bible says to comfort one another with these words. So while we do the things that we do on earth, we have somewhere at the back of our minds that someday this life will be folded like a curtain and we walk conscious of that reality. Have you been blessed? Now I can say for everybody who means business with Jesus, happy is sir. Hallelujah. You believe that? Amen. My teaching for tonight. Everything that you have been receiving, this is um, an appetizer.